Um, um, welcome here back to the CAT Center. As you know, this quarter, um, we are devoting it to the idea of Mexico in the world and the war in Mexico. And this time around, uh, we have a, a wonderful um, um, panel. And I think um, this is going to be a very unique. I always wanted to, to do something like this. And thanks to sentimental blackmailing and all sort of blackmailing, I was able to convince my good friends, um, Alma Guillermo Prieto and Valeria Luiselli to join me to discuss something that is very new and interesting in Mexico, which is what is to write Mexico in English now as a Mexican women writer writing in English. So previous to this, um, to our uh, uh, meeting today, to our talk today, I distributed uh, with Alma and Valeria, who need no introduction, as you know, uh, Alma has been one of the greatest chronicles of Latin America and Mexico uh, for many decades. Uh, we all benefit, we always teach uh, uh, her um, books in our courses, a wonderful writer uh, in English and Spanish. And I don't need to introduce Valeria Luiselli, um, uh, uh, the great novelist whose last novel uh, was directly written in English and apparently she will tell us is uh, following that path of writing directly in English. And so previous to this, I, 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 I distributed a couple of questions about, you know, why did you select uh, to write? Why did you opt to write in English? Was it an option or was not it an option? What were the consequences of such a uh, 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 decision. What did you win? Uh, what did you um, What did you win or or, or lost in 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 this decision? Um, uh, I told them, you know, the the the, the famous phrase uh, phrase by Santayana, uh, who believed to be saying many on English things in English. I tell them that you know writing in English for you is escaping the Mexican mandate is to say too many on English things in English. So what it is like, uh, what is it like to write? Um, once uh, in a coffee shop, uh, Alma told me, you know, writing in English is turbo. It's, it's moving fast. It's, it's, it's a turbo movement. I feel that I'm going faster in English. And I asked them also um, uh, whether they have something to say about uh, what it's about, uh, what it's to write in English as Mexican women, um, uh, uh, especially as women in, in nowadays in the uh, market of books and ideas in English in the United States. So these were the question. Now, uh, each one is going to take, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes to, to, to comment on these questions and then they will respond to each other and then we open it to the public. Um, so um, Alma and Valeria, thank you very much. Uh, uh, who wants to start? Go Alma. Um, well, I, I think the first thing I should say is that it wasn't really a choice for me to write in English. The, the fact is that nobody ever asked me to write in Spanish. Um, the, the Guardian newspaper in London, well, actually Latin American newsletters, which was run by a collective that included a friend of mine, uh, needed somebody to go to Nicaragua desperately. And this friend of mine had always thought that I should be a reporter, which is something that I vehemently rejected. I had no interest in it. I didn't know why I should be a reporter. Uh, it was the furthest thing in the world from my world. But there was this insurrection in Nicaragua and I was all of a sudden dying to go. As, as somebody who had suffered the, the defeat of the Allende regime, if it can be called that, in 1973 in Chile, and who had been in as much pain as any of us were, who watched the Chilean experiment with such joy and hope, 
um, and, and who then were destroyed by the coup against Allende, the possibility of seeing a revolution that somehow from the very beginning, I thought this is going to be a win. This is going to work. This is really going to happen. So I was desperate to go. Uh, Latin American newsletters and The Guardian desperately needed a reporter because their own stringer in Central America was out fishing and they couldn't get hold of him. And as a result, those two desires coincided and they offered to pay my expenses. I didn't know what the word expenses meant. And off I went. So from the very beginning, I was writing in Spanish, in, in English, but all of my colleagues from the Spanish speaking media, notably the Mexican colleagues, um, Carmen Lira and La Jornada, the Excelsior correspondence, nobody ever asked me to write in Spanish. Um, so it wasn't a choice. It was just what happened. Having started that way, I, I think that possibly the first consideration when somebody eventually did ask me not to write, but to authorize a translation of my work into Spanish. And that was Juan Villoro, who I will be always grateful to for having had that idea. Um, this was, let's see, I started writing in 1978 and around 1990, Four ninety-five. Juan Villoro called and said, would you authorize a translation of one of your stories? And I said, yes, of course. Um, but at that point, the possibility of making a living writing in Spanish didn't really, as a freelance writer writing in Spanish, didn't really exist. Um, there, there was no comparison in the pay scale. Just no comparison at all. And the only alternative to that would have been to join the staff of a newspaper. And that's something I wasn't ready to do. Um, I didn't care really whether it was in English or in Spanish, but I did need to make a living and I did need to write the way I wanted to write. And neither of those things were possible in the Spanish language media. Um, I don't know how much I need to explain about how newspapers and magazines in Mexico and in throughout Latin America operate, but they hire mostly very young reporters who work according to a strict pattern. The story has to be shaped like a pyramid and so forth. And they get paid a very low monthly salary, which is why you don't find that many old seasoned, experienced reporters in the Latin American media, because the moment they want to have a family, it's impossible. If you want to have children, it's impossible. So reporters have a, a brief life in general in Latin America, a brief professional life. We can talk about the other later on. Um, so again, it wasn't a choice initially, and it wasn't really a possibility later on. Um, and that's what I would say about choices and not choices. Perhaps Valeria um, has a different story to tell. Um, Alma, I'm so glad to... That that Mauricio put together just because I haven't had a conversation with you in such a long time. I haven't seen your face and COVID mm -hmm. and it's just been a, in too, way too long. Um, and I always love hearing your <laughs> everything, everything you tell, everything you, you tell, the way you tell it. Um, I had a very different beginning because I, I didn't start uh, out as a 
journalist. Um, but um, and in my case, I think there was a very clear choice, um, a moment of choice. I had been schooled in English throughout my entire life. Um, so English was to me the language of uh, instruction, the language of academic hierarchy, the language of uh, um, in which I was scolded in constantly at school. And Spanish was a kind of nostalgic uh, lost paradise for me. It was my mother tongue, uh, but also the language in which I had not grown up and that I spoke with a kind of awkwardness. I was, I, I, my Spanish wasn't very much alive when I, um, when I was in my 20s. It felt, I felt uh, at a linguistic disadvantage with my peers who seemed to be very sharp, very inventive, uh, to be able to, to twist things easily uh, in terms of um, creating a word games with double meaning as Mexican Spanish is so good at doing, right? And I felt uh, a little slow, you know, and a little uh, like not quite there. And so I wanted to root in Spanish. I wanted to root in my in my home city, uh, the city where I was born, La Ciudad de Mexico, but where I also had never really lived. So uh, I decided to write a book. Uh, I had no idea how to write a book. Uh, the book was later Papeles Falsos. It took me five years to write it, even though it's a very slim volume. I started writing it when I was 21 and finished writing it when I was in my mid-20s, maybe 25. Um, and I think it was the book that taught me how to write. Um, I never really felt that I was going to be able to finish it. It felt kind of an undo like an undoable thing, but I moved slowly, essay by essay, all the essays, somewhat about language, bilingualism and uh, cities and particularly Mexico City. So it's uh, the book itself was a laboratory for thinking about language and rootedness and the way of um, maybe turning place into space through um, through literary connection to that to that space. And um, and I wrote it in Spanish. Um, almost as a way to write myself into my language, right? Uh, and into my city. Um, and then, uh, I mean, I think to a degree, I became a Mexican writer <laughs> when, I, when, I, when that book was a young Mexican writer that I had published a book um, that was in Spanish and it was about Mexico City. But um, life never, you know, you never expect what what comes next and then and I and I left next uh, I, I left Mexico City after that and I've never lived there again actually um I let I mean I was that I, that was 20, 2007 I, I believe and, I, and since then I've never lived ne never lived there again um and my subsequent books um have all been uh or they've all passed through a moment in which I have to ask myself or not all of them, but most of them, where I have to ask myself, okay, which language is going to be the vehicle for this book? Um, and I've never known, by the way, I wish I could I could really understand this more deeply, but I don't, and I would love to hear your thoughts on, on this particular thing, Alma. I don't know if language is a vehicle um, that, that, it, that transmits thought, that is able to communicate thought, um, and meaning, um, or if it's not only an instrumental thing, not only a vehicle, but also a kind of um, space that that determines thought and constricts it, or 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 um, yeah, or determines how it's going to how it's going to be formed. To what degree does our language, the language that we use? Um, constrain, uh, determine, um, and give direction to our thought. Um, so it's one of the questions I always ask myself at the beginning of every book with Los Ingravidos, which is my second book. In fact, I started writing Los Ingravidos in English first. Wait um, a minute. What happened to Historia de Mis Dientes? Which Historia is de Mis Dientes wonder. is after. 
It's ah. after los ingravidos, and it it was a uh, there was no choice in that case because um, I wrote La Historia de Mis Dientes as a, as a series of installments for workers in, in a juice factory in La Fabrica de Jumex. And so, and they, they were all um, Mexican factory workers. And it was a project in Mexico and it had to be in Spanish because it was an interaction with people that were reading out loud as I was writing the book. So in, in that case, there was no, no, no choice. And it was um, the funnest book to write for me the, uh, in the sense that I never even thought of it as a book. It was more an exchange. It just grew and it was como desparpajado. And, um, and it never, it never, I never felt the pressure of having to write the second book. I think I tricked myself into writing a second book without knowing. And it was very, <laughs> it was, I think, uh, yeah, um, very lucky that it happened for me that way. But anyway, uh, aside from that book, every other book has been a torture of um, indecision for me. And I procrastinate sometimes for three or four years. Uh, and I don't begin properly writing because I, in my notebooks, I write in both languages, sometimes both languages at the same time. And it is not until I find that thing that we find when we are able to begin a book, which is a combination of, of rhythm and, and something kind of in the atmosphere uh, of, of, of the written word and um, something that is, of course, created through syntax that then creates rhythm. And, but, but that, of course, um, uh, is more than the sum of its parts, right? But that happens one day. And, uh, and, that's, and I just kind of ride that train when it, when it finally passes <laughs> in front of my door, you know? And um, so my last books have been in English, but I don't know what's, what's next. I mean, the project that I'm working on now is very bilingual. It's a sonic essay, a sound piece, a 24 hour sound piece about the history of violence and resistance in the US-Mexico borderlands. And um, it is na naturally and necessarily a, a very bilingual uh, piece. Um, it's multilingual, but but I what I write is bilingual. Um, and I'm working on a novel. I've been working on a novel for four years, and it's really nowhere yet. <laughs> but but it's in English. But it's it's um, the idea is is to translate it with my mother. So it's a mother tongue and mother translation project. Can everybody hear the horrible electric saw? No. No. Thank God. Okay. Um, uh, what What I would say is curious about both our situations is that at some point we have felt guilty about our bilingualism. Um, I remember we had a conversation about that, about whether it was okay to write so comfortably in English or whether it wasn't. And it took me a long time to work through that because it was an accusation when people said, but why do you write in English? It wasn't curiosity, it was an accusation. Absolutely, and, absolutely, yes. You know, what kind of Mexican are you? Yeah. I.e., what kind of traitor are you? Yeah. Um, and I think, I don't know how I became reconciled to the fact that I was in fact, for the better, most part, an English language writer. Until one day at a, at a dinner, um, this woman who, who I admired a lot because she was completely crazy, right? She was just a completely insane person. She was an actress, she was an antiques dealer. She had acted when I was very young. She was much older. I saw her acting in um, plays staged by Juan Jose Burrola. Mm -hmm. So she seemed to me naturally a bohemian and an artist. And artists tend to be not only multicultural, but multilingual in the sense that they accept all forms of communication. But all of a sudden, in the middle of dinner, she said, bueno, por fin, Alma. ¿Te vas a decidir algún día a ser mexicana? Oh. <laughs> ¿Vas a escribir en inglés o en español? 
No, por, por, no, she put it a different way. She said, ¿Por qué escribes tanto en inglés? Tanto. <laughs> and for once, I felt empowered, and I don't know where it came out of, to say, I'm never going to decide to give up one language. I have two languages. I have two riches. I have two treasures, because a language is a living, breathing treasure. And when you speak another language, you speak another world. Yeah. So it's a gift. And I'm never going to return that gift. Mm -hmm. And that was oh, such a moment of relief. Mm. And I don't know if that has enabled me to write better in Spanish at the same time. Mm. So have you had that moment of yeah, maybe not. No, not maybe. I I, I have yet some uh, some uh, path to to continue treading because I I I do have a um, a kind of weight. I ignore it in order to be able to write freely, but if I pay attention to it, it's there. A kind of uh, a feeling of a, a certain guilt, um, and I, I think it's very true what you say that whenever when. Uh, Whenever someone asks, maybe even Mauricio asking us, no, why do you write in English is a, is a way of, write, of, of asking, why do you not write in Spanish? <laughs> I'm joking, right. Mauricio. Or, or maybe, maybe you can respond later, Mauricio. Well, uh, well, my point is, uh, no, 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 I also write in English. And uh, no, I couldn't care. Uh, the question is, uh, what kind of... Um, advantages you have in English. More say, let me put it in this way. As late writing in English has become, it's not like writing in English when Alma Guillermo started, when Alma Guillermo Prieto started. Uh, Alma was, has a had always had a very beautiful prose in, 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 in English, very engaging and everything. But for instance, as the language transforms and the environment transforms, I feel, for instance, now, I cannot write things that I want to say in English because a, a language doesn't allow me to do it. The more I try to speak of certain topics, at least in academic English, which is the only English I can write, uh, I feel completely, uh, uh, if I feel it's completely impossible for me to express the irony and ambiguity and ambivalence I want to express in English because the English is a package that already includes I have to speak it in certain way. So I feel I have to do it in um, in Spanish, in which at least still I can have more uh, uh, control of uh, ambiguities um, in uh, uh, irony, which in English doesn't offer. So I don't, you know, I completely understand that people write about Mexico in English. And I think it's one of the language of Mexico as Spanish is one of the languages of the, of the United States. What I feel is, don't you feel the constraints? Don't you feel the problems of writing in either one? I mean, sometimes when I'm writing in Spanish, I want to write in English because I will go faster and it will be clear and everything. And when I write in English, you say, I cannot do this because if I say it, see, if I say it this way, I'm not Alma Guillermo Prieto. I cannot write in this beautiful, ambiguous English. It's either zero or one. English is like that. It's, you know, um, and in academic English, in the transformation, even of literary language with censorship and this and that, now English is a package which you have to swear alliance. Uh, otherwise, uh, you, be, you could be misconstructed. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I feel that way. Um, but uh, I do remember, um, and sort of going back to, to Alma's uh, question about my own experience, did I have that kind of moment of liberation where I was able to just say, yes, I do this and that's it. Um, and not, the answer is not really, maybe not yet, perhaps. Um, but I did have a moment that was rather funny um, in retrospect, in which um, I had just written an essay uh, called in English, Tell Me How It Ends, um, published in a, back then published in a, in, a, in a journal, in Freeman's journal. 
and I'd written it in English as a commission uh, from the journal directly. And uh, I was very interested. It's a it's a, an essay about immigration, uh, I and mean, particularly about the most recent uh, refugee crisis involving uh, hundreds of thousands of of children who had come to the U.S. alone and undocumented. Uh, and I had become very deeply engaged in the process as a translator for for cases in 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 court, basically translating testimonies so that lawyers could then take them on as cases and then defend uh, that child against a deportation order. So anyway, an essay had come out of those months working in court. But I was very interested because of the nature of the topic um, in in having that essay come out in Spanish as well and in Mexico. Um, so I sent it to Diego Rabasa and Eduardo Rabasa, my editors in Sexto Piso, and it was the first time ever that I'd written something of that length uh, uh, in, in, in English. I mean, I'd, I was writing my doctoral thesis in English and I'd written things here and there, but it was the, the first kind of larger thing that I'd written in English directly. And I sent it to them, asking them to help me find a magazine or journal to publish that piece in. And they read the piece, they read the essay, and they said, no, we would actually like to, to publish this as a book, as a maybe a short volume. And I thought, that's really not, not a great idea. I didn't feel that it was a book, that it didn't, I didn't have the, the gravity that a book I thought needs to have. And, and so I said, well, when I go to Mexico, we can meet and we'll discuss this. And so as things are with Sexto Piso, meet, a meeting means a cantina mezcales, uh, and the meeting at, after the third mezcal, they had convinced me that I was a traitor to my mother, to La Virgen de Guadalupe, to the publishing house. I, I, I had written something uh, in the language of the empire. And I remember uh, ending that meeting with signing. I, I signed a, a, a napkin uh, committing to retranslate into Spanish myself anything that I dare write in the language of the empire. <laughs> um, and they they forced me <laughs> through basically hacerme manita de puerco, forced me to, um, to rewrite that book, tell me how it ends, or that essay, tell me how it ends, into Spanish. And then I was so thankful that they had pressured me into that because when I did rewrite it in Spanish, it did become a book. Something happened in the rewriting of it it became um, uh, uh, something that with, with a different kind of gravity. And I think it was, uh, I think the, the switch was that I had been thinking of this uh, problem, the problem migration and this particular migration as a hemispheric phenomenon, of course, uh, the corridor between the, the Northern Triangle and the, the courts in the United States through the pipeline of, in Mexico. But I, even though I'd thought of it geographically in that way as a hemispheric phenomenon, as something that needed to be thought with that amplitude, I hadn't really, in my mind, had a conversation with, with Mexico. Um, so what happened when I was thinking in Spanish is that I was able to address my linguistic community much more clearly, and the book doubled, right? It's not a book about only the U.S. immigration system. It's also less so, but also uh, um, um, has Mexico present as as the other kind of accomplice into the horror that Central American children have to face, right? So anyway, all this to say that the rewriting in Spanish in the end was a, a great thing, but but it came out of a, a, a kind of an accusation of treat. Out of a guilt trip. This is very disappointing pointing to here because <laughs> I was about to say, literally, I was about to say, things have changed and we have, for example, the shining example of Eduardo Rabasa and Sexto Piso. And this is a more modern generation and they are more cosmopolitan and they are more open to the idea that language comes wherever it comes from. And you just told me that that's not true. <laughs> well, Alma, I think you think of us as young still, but we're not. <laughs> we're in our forties now. <laughs> so, so, so they started out young. They started out young. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the, the the concern that Mauricio 
has about censorship or not being able to say things in the language that's expected in English as a sort of classier language. I'm not mm -hmm. sure I, I agree with that. Uh, but I also should add that in order to have done the work I've done, what has been necessary for me in order not to have to choose a language, in order now to shift constantly between English and Spanish and what I write, is to be a freelancer, not answerable to anyone. Um, I, I think, and this may or may not be the case for you, Valeria, but, but as a free agent, uh, if I feel that kind of pressure, I'm free to leave. This comes at a price, uh, <laughs> really at a price, but what it gives me is that kind of freedom. Um, and the possibility at every moment of waiting for what Valeria has mentioned, you know, the, the atmosphere, the tone, what I think of as the moment when you open your throat and the right voice comes out and that voice has something to say and it's saying that in English or in Spanish and you're off to the races, right? Suddenly, oh, there's something to express and it asks to be expressed in a certain language. Um, you mentioned censorship as an idea and I think it exists on both sides. When I wrote uh, what in Spanish is called La Habana en un Espejo, the book about in Cuba, the, the memoir of when I was 20 years old and, and went to Cuba to teach dance, I, I had a very hard time with that because naturally I'd only written in English up to that point. I knew that there was this book that was somewhere waiting to find the shape of my mouth to come out. But I, I was also very aware that if I wrote it in English, not the censorship, but the constraints would make it impossible for me to write. And those constraints would be ideological. They would be about the Cold War and whether Fidel was a dictator or a liberator or whether he had fought against the Imperio, or whether he was a, a repressor of human rights. And I didn't want to become involved in that argument. It was an argument that made no sense to the 20 year old who traveled to Cuba to teach dance. And it was an argument that made no sense to me as a 50 year old who had been observing both countries by then for quite a while. Um, and by writing in Spanish, I would escape that whole ideological structure. And of course, after writing so long in English, I, I was, how am I going to do this? And Garcia Marquez was very much against this. I, I was working at the Fundación Nuevo Periodismo in Cartagena and teaching workshops. So I was in touch a great deal with Garcia Marquez. And he was very curious about what I was going to write about Cuba because of course he was so interested in Cuba. But he was also very worried about what language I was going to do it in and whether I was going to be able to switch. And in his opinion, I didn't do it successfully. Um, he, he thought that the language was dead, that it lacked the the vitality and the complication, the nuance that he thought I had in English. Um, so that was disheartening when he said that. <laughs> but but I, I felt something about this, Alma. Can I add yeah. something? Well, I, I read that book, um, uh, I think translated by Esther Allen in English. So I, yeah. I read you in English then. Uh, so I don't I don't I don't know if I read it also in Spanish. My memory of it is in English, but Working as a as such a brilliant and successful and always free, I think you know, the 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 freedom that you've defended all your life is something that I I admire 
so admire you so greatly for. Uh, but not only that, you were doing that within a generation of machos absolutos. No? That generation is that can how do, do you think that English gave you like uh, some freedom from the what might might have been a rather asphyxiating environment for a for a woman writer in that moment, or or am I uh, off course? Well, no, I don't. I think that we could talk about that aspect of it in a different context. In fact, in an English language context, just as much. Right. But, um, as much. Yeah, I would say. I would say I would say that the formalities of machismo are more visible in in Spanish, mm -hmm. but that the the bottom line reality of of the way men have historically related to women, and I'd like to take it away from the judgmental word machismo. I I think that that fundamental reality um, has the a bedrock in English as much as it does okay. in Spanish. But say, Alma, saw your book on in Spanish in Cuba, you, you felt censored or they asked you to change something? No, never. No, no, not at all. I felt that if I wrote it in English, I would inevitably have to address those questions because I would be addressing an English speaking language, an English speaking audience. No, there was no censorship involved ever in anything I've written, really, except that they've told me not to go on about the war on drugs so much because it's boring. Um, you know, repeating the same thing, the war on drugs, 50 years, unsuccessful, the greatest criminal war in the civil and plot. Uh, don't say that anymore. Other than that, um, no, there was none of that. That was not the problem. The problem was my own head and where it would be as I wrote in one language or another. Because to be bilingual is to have two worlds and those two worlds exist in two different heads. And it's hard to switch from one to the other head. Yeah. Um, and in fact, in order to write La Van en un Espejo, I had to wait for a couple of years while I wrote a column about food and Nexos. I, I remember, like a, yes. I had a monthly column in Nexos in which I thought I couldn't be funny in Spanish. I thought I couldn't be lyrical in Spanish. I thought I couldn't be subtle in Spanish. And the columns allowed me to figure out how to do that. But after, this is just one more thing, after I finished La Van en un Espejo, and it was translated so brilliantly by Esther, so brilliantly, um, I thought, I'm never going to be able to write in English again because writing in Spanish destroyed my English. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, well... it, was a, it was a problem. Now, I don't, maybe it's still a problem, but it's not as much of a problem as I feared. Yeah. Okay, um, let's open it up. If you can use the, 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 the Zoom hand up uh, so that I can, that I, we know who wants to ask a question to both. Gerardo. Okay. Uh -huh. Gerardo, we cannot hear you. Yeah, you can hear me now. Great. Thank you, Professor Tenorio, De and thank you to Guillermo uh, uh, and Manuela Luisa. They have, it has been wonderful, and I have two, two questions uh, from what you have said first. Um, what are difference or the experiences that you have faced uh, to whether there is actually two audiences, one in English and one in Spanish, when your work has been translated into from English to Spanish or from Spanish to English. So have you considered that you have to change things because of the of this uh, 
audiences or do you just start uh, uh, writing thinking in one audience and then you realize that you have a different uh, a different uh, audience and second question is i mean there is uh, I, I like what you said because it's worried that you you have this feeling of being a, a, a traitor of as mexicans because you're reading reading in, in you're writing in, in, in english but Considering that, what what is this? The, the is there an option for Spanglish here? And that's it. Thank you. Well, very quickly, just to your last question. I think there are people who are writing brilliantly, not quite in Spanglish, uh, but a, a very good approximation of that. Um, La Vida Portentosa de Oscar Wow. Uh, why can't I remember? Juno Diaz. Juno Diaz, for example. No? But he is living in the Spanglish world. And so he can write in that language. I don't live in the Spanglish world. I've lived the great majority of my life in Latin America. And so that would not, I wouldn't know even how to begin. But I think Spanglish is, yes, of course, it's, it's the language that a, a vast number of people speak in the United States from all over Latin America. Um, and it's very, very rich. Mm -hmm. it, it should be worked as a literary language much more, I think. No sé qué piensan. Sí, opino lo mismo. Este, pienso en los textos de Gloria Anzaldúa, por ejemplo. But I think, and I think contemporary poets, even much more so than Juno. Juno, I think Juno still writes in English with a sprinkle of, of Spanish here and there, ¿no? And, um, but I think younger generations are, uh, and people in spoken word are, are doing much, a much better job at really uh, bringing to... to uh, not, not not bringing to life because that, that language is very much alive, but but bringing into a literary space a, a language that that has usually been um, more thought of as something existing in a, in the private realm. Um, but I th I think we have yet to see the great Spanglish novel. Like it, there, it does not yet. Uh, I don't think it it really does exist yet. Um, and I don't know what the pushback might might be from from editors and markets. I. I I'm not sure, um, but I imagine there will be a moment where one one text is brilliant enough, is uh, uh, brave enough, is is uh, that that it break breaks through that barrier, and that will be a very happy moment, I think, for for literature. Yes, absolutely. Okay, Alma, uh, Ada. Hi, um, thank you both um, for being here and talking to us. I have two questions, but I'll pose one first and then see where the conversation goes and maybe I'll ask the other one. Um, so I am really interested in this kind of a Spanglish, I mean, well, also Spanglish, but um, Spanish and writing in English and Spanish um, because um, the first time I read Alma, it was in Spanish. And I grew up in Puerto Rico. Um, and that was given to me as a model of how to write in Spanish or like I, I liked writing. So someone said, like, you should, you know, you should look at this writer. Um, and so now I'm so interested because you say that writing in Spanish um, kind of like made you scared of writing in English again. Um, but then what I see is that perhaps your Spanish had a lot of influ influence of English already, right? So I think of this question a lot. Um, I think Borges was so obsessed with English because he saw a lot of qualities in it that he couldn't write in Spanish, for example. Um, and so I wonder, since I now write in both languages, like if you can point out what do you steal from each of them um, to write in the other, if that is a, a, a thing you have thought about at all. Thank you. Um, well, just on the very practical side, when I write in English and I publish in, in an English language magazine, there exists this thing called fact checkers. Uh, so the obligation to be accurate is 
much greater, to be factually accurate, yeah? When I started writing in Spanish, fact checkers were not a thing. In fact, I taught the first workshop, my first workshop for Latin American journalists. And I talked about fact checkers and everybody was like, oh. And some people said, oh no, that would ruin my style. And other people said, oh, that's fantastic. But it was a great new thing. And now there is fact checking, but they don't have the financial resources to do the kind of fact checking they do in English. So in Spanish, even though I try to fact check myself, I also feel much freer. I also feel because it is my mother tongue, I also feel more comfortable. Um, I, I, I kind of relax. And I think that relaxed posture is important. Yeah. Um, the, the things I can talk about perhaps are more intimate than in English. I don't, I don't know. Whatever I'm borrowing is unconscious. And I would advise you, and you should always take advice and throw it away if it doesn't serve your purposes. Uh, but I would advise you not to overthink and not to overexamine because that for writers tends to be a very paralyzing thing. Yeah. If she's not taking that advice, I'm, I'm going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> Free and available to all. Luisito. Thank you. I have a question for Valeria regarding three different experiences of translation. One is Christina Maxuini translating you into English, you translating yourself, and then Daniel Saldana Priest translating you into Spanish. What has been your favorite one? Which is the path you will choose from now on? Is there a way you choose how to do that? Or is that also like a gut feeling that you have? Um, um, well, I, I would not dare say what my favorite one is because then the other <laughs> is bound to find out, found out, find out. Um, I I've enjoyed, honestly, both both um, being translated by Christina and Daniel. Both of them are very playful translators. I think, like, if they have a kind of theoretical corpus of of translation as an art, they probably share it in, for the most part. And I think that they both think, uh, or at least that's how they, how they act as translators. Of um, I think they think of translation um, uh, as as something that uh, is not um, there to. It's it's not an activity that should, as they say, domesticate a foreign language and make it palatable for a, le a readership, but rather on the contrary. Um, an activity through which you can bring a kind of foreignness uh, and attention into a language through um, through the contamination, the fertile contamination of it um, by means of, of something foreign, something other, right? And I think that they they play with that foreignness very well. Um, and I really appreciate that. I, I never felt that uh, any of them were uh, trying to yeah to make my writing more palatable to and not to a specific linguistic audience but rather allowed it to to flow freely uh, as it as it was and self-translation is torturous i was able i don't know why i was able to so quickly and uh, to to translate or rewrite los eh, los niños perdidos which is tell me how it ends um i must have been running on a, like some kind of steam <laughs> like last bit of something but I, I i was able to do it without too much thought um and i was in the process of writing the novel at the same time and when i tried i did try because i had committed to to rewriting in spanish everything that i wrote in the language of the current empire uh, i i really did try to to self-translate the novel and it felt uh overwhelming and frustrating. Every time I began with a with a fragment, I changed so much of it that that it was always it was going to be a completely different novel. And uh, and a novel is a very big animal. It's very difficult to 
to replicate, you can't just replicate it, right, in another language. So I, I, I thought I was going to, to kill it if I, if I did it myself. So we decided to, to find someone to, to be more faithful to the original somehow. Okay, um, I'm afraid that um, although as, as convincing as I was with my sentimental uh, blackmailing of both, I promised <laughs> Alma that I was going to finish sharp part two because she has an interview. So thank you very much, both of you. I really appreciate uh, you accepting to come to talk to us at the CAT Center. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mauricio. Que gustazo verte. Nos vemos en México, Alma. Chao, Mauricio.